members, Ian Young, and I put the great honour to the Vice Chancellor of Australian National University. I'd like to begin by acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and paying my respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal people, past and present. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to what is the 10th Sir Roland Wilson Annual Oration. Tonight we're joined by Sir Roland Wilson Foundation Chair, Dr Ken Henry, the board of the Wilson Foundation, secretaries from several Commonwealth departments, <coughs> members of the ANU Executive and the Sir Roland Wilson Scholars. The Sir Roland Wilson Foundation was established by a gift from the Wilson family matched by the ANU to promote a significant dialogue and research interest in public policy. In 2011, the Foundation embarked on a new initiative in partnership with the Commonwealth to award PhD scholarships to senior Commonwealth public servants to pursue topics of national and enduring interest in public policy. We now have some 17 scholars in the program, and the first of this cohort is due to graduate at the end of this year. Before I introduce our guest speaker, I would like to take just a few minutes to refresh your memory about Sir Roland Wilson. In 1932, Roland Wilson was the first economist to be appointed to a senior position in the Commonwealth Public Service. He went on to be appointed as Head of Treasury in 1951 at the age of 47, and he held that position until he resigned in 1966, the longest serving Head of Treasury. Wilson held two doctorates, and as anyone involved in uh, uh, university life will tell you, it's clearly one too many, uh, but two doctorates, one from Oxford and a second from the University of Chicago, where he studied with the noted economist, Jacob Viner. His thesis was on capital movements and their economic consequences. Sir Roland Wilson's greatest work in Treasury was in fostering a more efficient and dynamic economy. He was opposed to Australia's high rates of trade protection, often putting at odds, him at odds with his colleagues. Wilson was primarily interested in accelerating Australia's economic development, and it was a period of quite remarkable growth. The Roland Wilson Foundation continues to make an important contribution to public policy, and from my point of view, to bring a closer relationship between the university, the Australian National University, and the public service, something which is uh, very central to the current university's mission. So with that background, it's my great pleasure this evening to introduce the Honourable John Howard, Australia's 25th Prime Minister, holding the office for 11 years from 1996 to 2007. Since retiring from politics, Mr Howard has released his autobiography, Lazarus Rising, and also, more recently, The Menzies Era, an account of the years of post-war economic prosperity and Cold War anxiety over which Sir Robert Menzies presided as Prime Minister until his retirement in 1966. Tonight, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the Honourable Mr John Howard, former Prime Minister of Australia, to deliver the 10th Wilson Oration. Well, thank you very much, uh, Vice-Chancellor. Can I acknowledge uh, Dr Ken Henry, the Chairman of the Roland Wilson Foundation, and many um, former public service advisors and counsellors of mine and students of the university, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I should commence my remarks by congratulating uh, the AMU in scoring so well in the news poll of world universities. Uh, the uh, ratings of the ANU have held up extremely well and uh, the university deserves congratulations for the esteem in which it is held uh, around the academic community. It is um, <clears throat> a special honour for me to deliver this lecture tonight. Um, I think it's fair to say that the first time I spent much time looking at banknotes at the age of 12, uh, the signature of Roland Wilson uh, and H.C. Coombs uh, appeared uh, on those banknotes. And that reminds me um, of um, 
a remark that was frequently made to me uh, at Liberal Party meetings that I began attending in the late 1950s and early 1960s. And I would frequently hear esteemed members uh, of my chosen political party say, I've got one big complaint about Bob Menzies, and that is he kept on those two socialists, Wilson and Coombs. And as time went by and um, I learnt a little more about Wilson and Coombs, uh, I understood that uh, that remark was particularly inappropriate in relation to Roland Wilson, as to whether it was entirely inappropriate in relation to the other gentleman is an open question. Let me put it, and let me put it as diplomatically as that. Uh, Roland Wilson, of course, was, uh, or is rather, uh, Australia's longest serving Treasury Secretary. And he served as Secretary of the Treasury uh, from, I think, April of 1951 until October or November of 1966. That was not only a very long period, it was a period of tranquility and stability in relation to the occupancy of the Treasury portfolio. Because for most of that time, the Treasurer was either the long-serving Sir Arthur Batten or the almost equally long-serving Harold Holt. And at the tail end of it, after the retirement of Sir Robert Menzies, uh, the Treasurer that Wilson served with was William McMahon. It was a very long and very tranquil, stable period. By contrast, and this reminds me of the very first conversation I had in my newly um, minted position of Treasurer of the Commonwealth late in 1977 in rather unexpected circumstances, and the then Treasury Secretary, Sir Frederick Wheeler, and uh, Sir Frederick Wheeler uh, looked me straight in the eye and he said, Treasurer, I have been Secretary of the Treasury for six years and you are the sixth Treasurer that I have served. <laughs> and uh, it, it, it left me feeling rather uneasy, yes, uh, <laughs> given that he'd worked his way through so many Treasurers in that period of time, but then I reflected that he was due to retire the following year <laughs> and that perhaps some stability would return. But um, in a way, uh, the stability in relation to the personnel of the Treasury portfolio was a metaphor for the stability of that period of time in Australia's economic history. I've had occasion in writing my second book, The Menzies Era, uh, to reflect on that period of time, it was a period of remarkable uh, political and economic tranquility and stability. It was not, of course, an uneventful period, either economically or politically, and it did bring together not only Australia's longest-serving Treasury Secretary, but also Australia's longest-serving Prime Minister because for all but, I think, about 14 or 15 months at the beginning uh, of uh, <coughs> Menzies' period as Prime Minister, Roland Wilson was the Secretary of the Treasury. And uh, they developed a particular partnership. Uh, they obviously had <coughs> very uh, strong regard for each other. It was an era, of course, in which the relationship between the public service and the government was different from what it would ultimately become, but perhaps not as different uh, as some uh, of the cynics and some of the more obsessive commentators uh, uh, would now avow. Certainly the role of private office advisers, um, other than people who came straight out of the public service, uh, didn't exist. Uh, and the idea that people other than departmental officers would give ministers policy advice uh, was almost abhorrent uh, to people such as Sir John Bunting and Sir Roland Wilson. But to counter that, can I say, I had an extremely successful experience as Prime Minister with a former distinguished public service servant in Arthur Sinodinus, who was my chief advisor, uh, advisor uh, the chief of staff rather, and a regular advisor on policy matters. Roland Wilson's period of, Treasurer of, of Secretary of the Treasury was not, of course, 
um, uh, without a drama uh, and without turbulence. Within a few months of becoming uh, Secretary of the Treasury, he and the then Treasurer Sir Arthur Fadden had to deal with the uh, destabilising economic consequences of the wool boom uh, that arose out of the ferocious acquisition of wool stockpile by the Americans at the time of the Korean War. And for a period of some 12 months, I think in either 1951 or 1952, inflation rose by 23% uh, in uh, a period of a year, but remarkably it returned to uh, uh, more normal and much lower levels uh, within a period of, of 12 months. And it was one of the number of occasions during the Menzies years, and this of course was a period of fixed exchange rates. It was long before the float of 1983. Uh, there were many occasions when within the coalition government there were tensions about the value of the currency. And on that particular occasion, there was a push by many Liberal members of the coalition for a discrete appreciation of the value of the pound, and that was resisted uh, by some Liberals and members of the country party as it then was, and ultimately what was settled upon as a device for handling the problem uh, was to impose a special tax on wool receipts uh, and uh, they credit that into a, an account to be applied against future taxation liabilities uh, of graziers and that resulted in returning a great deal of stability to the situation. I mention that uh, to uh, remind uh, you and remind the audience of the fact that although it was a period of extraordinary tranquility and great economic growth and very low unemployment, uh, rising uh, levels of home ownership and uh, a seemingly endless uh, uh, a period of economic stability it was not without challenges. And in any fair examination of that period, uh, enormous credit has to be given, uh, not only, of course, to uh, the leaders of the government, of particularly of Menzies and Fadden, and later on John McEwen and Harold Holt, but also the credit had to be given uh, to the advice received from uh, that person so uh, inappropriately described as a wretched socialist by uh, some of by the people I met when I first joined the Liberal Party. I was fond when I was Prime Minister of saying that economic reform uh, was like uh, competing in a never-ending foot race. Uh, the finishing line kept proceeding, but if you didn't keep trying to get there, uh, others in the race would go past you. And uh, I thought that was an apt metaphor to describe the challenge uh, that we now have. Economic reform remains a major challenge for Australia at the present time. There is a view that the process of economic reform has stalled, and that is uh, an argument that I want to address and, and contribute a couple of observations about uh, in the remaining part of, of my remarks. The Menzies period, of course, was one of very great economic stability and growth and prosperity. It was part due to good management, it was also due to world economic circumstances. And uh, I think any fair study of the economic history of that period in the early 1970s will tell us that uh, it came very much to an end in the early 1970s with such unsettling things as the quadrupling uh, of uh, world oil prices, the end of the Bretton Woods fixed exchange rate arrangements and, and much of the other economic turbulence uh, uh, which uh, followed the pressures on the American economy flowing out of the way in which the Vietnam War was uh, financed uh, first by the Johnson administration and then by the Hawke administration, by, then by the Nixon administration. The Hawke period of government in Australia saw very significant economic changes. One of the benefits enjoyed by that government was the willingness of the then opposition to support most, not all, but most of the major economic initiatives of that government, such as the floating of the Australian dollar, which is, was far, by far, in my view, the most significant economic reform that this country has experienced over the last 30 to 40 years, 
also the very significant reductions in tariff protection, which for a Labor government was a courageous thing to do given its association with the trade union movement. In the, and I, I reflect upon the fact that it's now almost 30 years since the tax summit, uh, uh, where um, my successor as Treasurer, Paul Keating, uh, proposed option C, which was a 12.5% consumption tax. And if my memory serves me correctly, I think I, as Opposition Treasury spokesman, afforded more support to Mr Keating's proposal for the 12.5% consumption tax than he received from his then Prime Minister uh, or the then leaders uh, of the trade union movement. Now, I mention that just as an anecdote in passing um, <laughs> to uh, sort of make, make an obvious point. And I also might mention as an anecdote in passing that when it came to the introduction of the goods and services tax, um, that bipartisanship was not repaid. Um, and I think it's fair to say that just as the most important economic reform of my time in Parliament was the floating of the dollar as far as its consequences were concerned, the hardest was the introduction of the GST, because not only was the introduction of the GST vehemently opposed by uh, the then opposition, but the GST had a far greater impact on the daily lives and uh, the patterns of economic behaviour of the average citizen than did the float uh, of the dollar. When you look at economic reform uh, over the last 30 years, I think it's fair to say a couple of things in assessing why it is that it does appear to have stalled at the present time. One of them is that in, to some degree, you take yourself back 30 years, there were, uh, when we reflect on it properly, there were some low-hanging fruit uh, of economic reform. We did uh, self-evidently need uh, significant changes to our taxation system. The Asprey report, which was the first economic report to my knowledge to recommend uh, the introduction of a broad-based indirect tax, uh, was uh, handed to the Whitlam government in 1975, having been initiated by Billy Snedden when he was treasurer in the last months of the McMahon government. But it took a very long time 1975 until 2000 for uh, a GST to be finally introduced, but uh, anybody who brought serious study to the state of Australia's economy during those years uh, ought to acknowledge that uh, the need for taxation reform uh, was very strong indeed. The need for the privatisation of government enterprises uh, also falls into that category. As time went by, it became overwhelmingly necessary and desirable that uh, the government relinquish ownership uh, of such uh, organisations as uh, uh, Qantas and then Australian Airlines and uh, uh, ultimately, of course, the Commonwealth Bank. The Commonwealth Bank was the last uh, act of privatisation carried out by uh, the Labor government prior to the election of my government in 1996 and I, I do remember uh, the, in the afternoon of the last Keating government budget delivered by Ralph Willis, um, I was rung by Kim Beasley, the finance minister, a man on the other side of politics with whom I've always enjoyed a pleasant relationship and uh, he said to me, I remember it very vividly, John are you still in favour of privatising the Commonwealth, the rest of the Commonwealth Bank? And uh, I said, yes, I am. And he said, well, I'm going to need your vote to get it through the Senate <laughs> uh, because uh, the Australian Democrats were opposed to it. And uh, as it turned out, uh, uh, he did receive our vote to get it through the Senate, although not before quite justifiably. Uh, Peter Costello um, characterised Ralph Willis's commitment to the public service unions that the privatisation would not take place as uh, the equivalent of issuing a false prospectus in uh, uh, floating a company, but uh, uh, I, I, leave, I leave that to one side. When I look at the challenge of economic reform at the present time, I've, I've really got um, a couple of central observations to make. The first of those is that I still believe 
of the Australian public will accept the desirability of economic reform uh, if two conditions are satisfied. The first of those conditions is that the public must be persuaded that it is in the national interest. Australians still do look to the national interest. I know the uh, popular uh, cry from many commentators and I fear uh, also many political participants. The common cry is that uh, the public is not concerned about the national interest. Of course, individual members of the public are rightly concerned about the well-being of themselves and their own families, but they do have a capacity to look beyond it. And uh, I think providing a strong argument is made in favour of the national interest, reform is still possible. I think the other condition is that it must be seen uh, fundamentally as fair and not imposing too harsh a burden on vulnerable sections of the community. And if those two uh, uh, conditions can be satisfied, <clears throat> then I believe that uh, the public will embrace uh, economic reform. And drawing on my own experience and that of my government uh, in relation to the introduction of the GST, uh, I recall that whenever we advanced arguments such as uh, this is a reform whose time has come, uh, those arguments were greeted uh, with supreme disinterest. It sounded too much like uh, an ideological ploy, but when the argument was that it makes more sense to tax what you spend rather than tax what you earn, uh, and uh, that introducing a GST will increase, increase the export competitiveness of Australian industry, uh, the public was willing to go along with that. But it had to be accompanied uh, by uh, plenty of reassurances in relation to the structure of the tax <coughs> that individuals in the community, the more vulnerable section of the community, uh, could not be uh, disadvantaged by that. And uh, I think it's fair to say that when an argument is addressed to the national interest, uh, the public will take notice, providing the supporting uh, arguments uh, go to the national interest and not to some kind of ideological prejudice or some kind of sectional interest. One of the greatest challenges that uh, those in politics face today, and I think it applies to people both in government and in opposition. And uh, I assert very strongly, and I hope in a modest way, I was able to practice it when in politics, that oppositions have reform responsibilities as well as governments. The idea that once you go into opposition, you have no responsibility uh, to support sensible reforms is not a proposition that I could in any way support. And I think it's very important that both sides of politics in Australia understand that. We are, of course, now living in a far less tribal political state uh, than what we used to live in. When I was uh, growing up and getting engaged in politics, uh, there seemed to be in existence what was called a 40-40-20 rule, not a 30-20 rule, known to those who studied the Australian financial system of that period, but a 40-40-20 that 40% of the public always voted Labor, 40% voted for the Coalition, and 20% moved around in the middle. And um, if you think that's <coughs> uh, lacking substance, can I remind you that uh, in the 1960s, uh, the nadir uh, of the Labor Party's fortunes was reached at the 1966 election, when on a two-party preferred vote, Carol Holt's victory of that election was the greatest calculated by a two-party preferred vote uh, of any side of politics since the end of World War II. Um, and yet the Labor Party's primary vote at that election did not fall below 40%. Yet its primary vote at the 2013 election had fallen to 33%. We have seen the fragmentation of politics on both sides. It appears as though we have at the moment a detachable flank of about 15% uh, of the uh, once core vote of the two sides of politics. 
and in the case of the Labor Party, that much of that goes off to the Greens, uh, and you have plenty of evidence of that, particularly in the recent New South Wales election. And uh, in the case of the Coalition, uh, of the 1998 election, wandered off to Pauline Hanson's One Nation Party, and uh, the last election, uh, some of it wandered off to uh, the Palmer United Party. Uh, we are living in a less tribal political state, and uh, the binary system which brought a certain amount of uh, unity and predictability to political outcomes uh, has changed a great deal. And one of the consequences of that change has been, of course, a very big change, and I think it's very important, and perhaps not as commonly understood and remarked upon as it should be, a big change in the composition and attitude of the principal crossbench party uh, in the Senate, and therefore in Australian politics. There's an enormous difference between the Australian Democrats and the Australian Greens. Uh, it was possible for the coalition government to negotiate significant economic reforms with the Australian Democrats. I would be very surprised if it's possible for the coalition government to negotiate major economic reforms with the Australian Greens. I recall, of course, that in 1996, Peter Reid, as Industrial Relations Minister, was able to negotiate most of his workplace reform measures. Uh, with Cheryl Curnow, who was then the leader of the Australian Democrats. And those negotiations included the crucial introduction of individual workplace contracts, which represented, in a sense, the core of the difference in the approach of the Coalition and the Labor Party to the organisation of industrial relations, because it was the introduction of individual contracts that took away the monopoly on the bargaining process enjoyed under the old system and which essentially has been returned as, as a result of the changes made by the Rudd and Gillard governments. And then even more uh, well remembered, of course, was the negotiations we were able to have with the Australian Democrats uh, in relation to the introduction of the GST. And although the introduction of the GST <coughs> was um, uh, less than what the public had voted for at the 1998 election and crucially excluded uh, coverage of fresh food and a number of other items. And that, of course, uh, when the uh, downturn after 2008 came, had a very big impact on the revenues flowing to the states because of the inelastic uh, nature of demand for fresh food and those other items. Nonetheless, the fact that we were able to achieved something like 80 to 85 per cent of our reform package through negotiations with the Australian Democrats is very important. Now that has changed and that has complicated things uh, for the current government and it is a factor uh, that does need to be kept in mind. I think the other big change that's occurred in Australian politics, and this is something that afflicts both sides of politics perhaps, it's a little more advanced in the case of the Labor Party and particularly a little more advanced in both parties at a state level than it is at a federal level. And that is um, the increasing proportion of people who enter Parliament without having had any occupational experience other than in politics. Now, I am uh, the last person uh, to decry uh, active participation in a political party or the demonstration of ambition for influence within a political party. But I do worry that we have perhaps a too great a proportion of people in politics who have not had any job other than in politics. Uh, in the case of a person on the Labor side, uh, university, a period of service in a union office and then on a politician staff and then in the parliament. In the case of a coalition member, the period of service in the union office is normally skipped and uh, <laughs> uh, they transition directly uh, to the politician's office and then into parliament. And uh, when I first entered parliament in 1974, there were uh, a large number of former trade union officials 
uh, amongst the Labor members and senators, but the difference in many cases was that they had, in most cases, they had shorn a few sheep uh, or, 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 or fixed, uh, built a few houses, uh, or uh, in fact had been uh, furniture manufacturers or whatever uh, activity that might have been involved, and that is uh, even less so now. But I think it's fair to observe that um, uh, we have two state premiers at the present time who come into that category, and they're both newly elected, the premiers of Queensland and the premiers of Victoria. They may, of course, turn out to be outstanding leaders and outstanding premiers, and I uh, acknowledge that and I reflect not in any personal way, but I use them as examples. Now, what is, how is this relevant uh, to uh, the reform process? I think it's relevant in this sense. Uh, the people whose only preoccupation has been with what I might call the internal machinations of politics, and it's been their daily job. I mean, it's one thing to uh, do something during the day, be a, be a teacher or a public servant uh, or a lawyer or a doctor, and then uh, do politics at night and at the weekends. It's another thing to be working full time on somebody's staff and doing nothing else. Uh, and uh, I do think it, it breeds, perhaps over time, it breeds a different attitude. Now, coming to the, the present situation and the circumstances that um, uh, face the current government, uh, we're all, of course, um, waiting with some anticipation for the budget on Tuesday night. Some of it's been talked about. I, uh, I understand that, and different governments have different approaches uh, uh, to, the, to, to budgets. Uh, I think one of the... Um, observations I'd like to make about the general economic climate is that um, uh, we are, in my view, living in certain uncharted waters in an unpredictable environment in that the progressive reduction of interest rates uh, and the, the circumstance where there appears to be large amounts of liquidity within the system does not appear uh, to have had the sort of impact that it might have had uh, on economic activity five or ten years ago. Now, whatever the reason for that is, it's uh, complex, but I think it is a factor to be borne in mind that some of the economic circumstances in which we are now uh, existing are different, and that the reactions of um, economies around the world, uh, and Europe is a, a prime example, uh, the United States, I, I think, is different. I think the United States, uh, despite the stuttering of the uh, first quarter's uh, statistics, uh, I think the United States is essentially recovering. I am very pessimistic about the situation in Europe. I, I think the construct of the euro is fundamentally flawed. Uh, the idea that you can have a uh, a monetary union without having a fiscal union is absurd, and I don't believe that Europe will ever have a fiscal union, uh, notwithstanding the pronouncements of, of those who, who believe in uh, the unaccountable and essentially undemocratic nature of the, uh, of the European project. I, I think it's uh, unlikely in the extreme that, for example, the French National Assembly uh, is ever going to give up uh, the right to determine taxation policy uh, to a supra-European uh, body. Of course, the phenomenon of what I spoke of earlier of the fragmentation of politics in Australia and the breakdown of tribalism is uh, uh, exquisitely illustrated in the United Kingdom and political tragics such as myself, uh, of course, find the current... Uh, <laughs> election in the United Kingdom quite extraordinary and uh, I'll be looking forward to spending plenty of time on Friday morning uh, watching the results as they are counted on uh, cable television. But there are parallels. Um, yeah, and I know it's stretching uh, perhaps uh, the analogy a little, but you can almost see in the Scottish Nationalist Party a parallel with the Australian Greens and you can see in the, in the Australian Democrats who are no longer a force to parallel with the Liberal Democrats, but you are seeing with both the Labor Party in the UK and uh, the Conservative Party in the United Kingdom 
you can see that the uh, once um, presumed level of support uh, within the electorate is no longer there and uh, some of the conservative support has gone off to the United Kingdom Independence Party. Uh, the Labor support appears to have gone off big time to the Scottish Nationalists uh, in Scotland and uh, you have other parties in the mix. Now this is a circumstance that all democracies have got to deal with and the reason I've stressed it tonight is that of all the lessons I took out of my um, 33 years in Parliament uh, was that you have to have um, a proper uh, understanding uh, of the uh, interaction of, uh, of politics and policy. It is true, as um, one of my predecessors said, that uh, good um, policy is good politics. Uh, yes, that's true, but it's also true that it, it's better to be, when it comes to policy, it's better to be 80% pure in government than 125% pure in opposition. Uh, and that it is necessary to strike a balance. And I think of the economic debate that I observe at the moment, perhaps the thing that um, irritates, disillusions me more than anything else is um, uh, when I hear um, business leaders uh, saying uh, to the government and saying to the political cohort, whether it's government or opposition, um, uh, you've got to demonstrate uh, more leadership uh, and uh, you've got to run the country like a business. Uh, running the country is not like running a business. Uh, but if you are charged with running the country, you need to have a very good understanding of business and you need to have a proper interaction with business. And uh, Finding that balance between the two uh, is fundamentally very important. And those who do successfully implement reform and have done so over the years are those who have been more successful than others uh, in achieving the balance between those two. So bringing my um, thoughts together, uh, can I finish on the point that I made a few moments ago, and that is that I don't despair about um, the possibility of achieving further economic reform. I think it stands beyond argument that at some point, and just how and in what manner, and against what background is a matter for current practitioners of the art of politics to resolve, but it stands without argument that we must return to taxation reform, uh, and we must return to industrial relations reform, uh, we should address some of the deficiencies of the Federation, but I don't think we should get carried away with the idea that you can start from scratch with the Federation. Uh, I, maybe I've lost my sense of adventure, but uh, uh, I think uh, starting from scratch, the Federation, when I, I look at this, uh, this expression of concern from Western Australia about the division of the GST. And I understand that, but I also remember going to loan council meetings when they existed as treasurer, when Western Australia was a mendicant state, uh, and that um, most, of the, most of the complaints uh, were from New South Wales and Victoria. And essentially what I think is happening with Western Australia is that there is a short-term issue. I can understand the the electorate in Western Australia are fairly aggrieved about the short-term consequences and it seems to me that the, if, I, if what I read in the papers is correct and uh, I still do read the papers very closely, uh, the government appears to have been addressing it against that background. So I think it is, it is possible to um, isolate some of the things that do need to be addressed and they are some of them, but more generally and what is important for all of us to remember and all of us who are concerned about the quality uh, of uh, government and the quality of reform process uh, is to bear in mind that the Australian people are fundamentally capable and willing to embrace reform. They do worry about the future of this country. They will listen 
to an argument that's addressed to the national interest, but it does need uh, to be uh, seen by the community as fundamentally fair. And can I finish with a personal anecdote from the very first budget that I introduced as Treasurer in 1978, which is an awful long time ago. And um, one of the measures in that budget was a proposal to um, abandon the policy of twice yearly indexation of the pension <laughs> and to index the pension annually. Uh, that proposal died in the coalition party room because it was seen as uh, fundamentally unreasonable and unfair. Uh, it was an interesting experience and a reminder that there are some things that people do regard as uh, unfair and unworkable, and yet uh, over the years, not only in that in the Fraser government, but uh, of course through the experience in opposition in relation to the Hawke government and our own period in government, far more major and significant changes were introduced. But uh, because that proposal was seen as unfair by the Australian community, uh, it, it was never going to be a fire and it ultimately uh, it died a death of a thousand cuts in the coalition party room and it was a salutary uh, lesson to me from the very beginning of the importance of that. I finish on a personal note, I have, I have enormous uh, uh, respect uh, and uh, warmth towards the current government and the current Prime Minister in particular, he was a wonderful minister of mine in period that we're in government and I remain very optimistic about his capacity uh, to uh, uh, do the right thing by this country and to deliver good outcomes for the future of our economy. Thank you very much. Refreshing it is to hear sanity spoken. Um, one shouldn't have to say that, but, um, but I feel like saying it. Um, and this is a time in which sanity needs to be spoken. You have, uh, Mr. Howard, agreed generously to take questions from the audience, and we do have some time. We have some microphones roving. Um, and so if you would like to ask Mr Howard a question, here's your opportunity. And I'm sure there will be many questions from the audience. There's one down here. Thank you, Mr Howard. This is one. Thank you, Mr Howard. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Ah, good. Um, thank you for your... Right. Thank you for your uh, wonderful comments about economic reform. I've got three, a three-pronged question, very quickly. Um, do you have any regrets that you didn't offer any apology to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people over your term as Prime Minister? Second, did you have any regrets about any ambiguity about the children over both saga and subsequent political gain? And thirdly, do you have any comments about the National Disability Insurance Scheme that wasn't even a twinkle in anyone's eye during your term. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, again, in relation to um, the first question, um, I did not think a, a formal apology was appropriate. And one of the reasons I didn't think it was appropriate was that I did not accept the central proposition of the Bringing Them Home report that genocide had been committed against the indigenous people of this country. And therefore, I was not willing uh, to embrace a formal apology. Having said that, I accept that a formal apology has been given. I accept also that um, um, many indigenous leaders that I respect um, feel that the giving of the apology was beneficial. It's not something that uh, you revisit but if you're asking me, do, if I had my time over again, would I have taken a different position? The answer is no, I would not. 
um, in relation to the children overboard um, incident. Um, uh, it, it remains my position, as I stated at the time, that the, the major thing on people's minds is they voted in 2001 on the subject of uh, asylum seekers was the success my government had achieved in stopping boats. Uh, I don't think the children overboard issue influenced many boats at all. It was not deliberately uh, stated. There was clearly a breakdown in communication between um, uh, sections uh, of the Defence Department and other sections and also between the um, Department and the then Minister. I don't think there was any uh, attempt by the then Minister, for whom I had enormous regard, and it was Peter Reith, um, to mislead the Australian public. Uh, you will recall that there were a number of inquiries, and you'll also recall that the um, senior public servant and uh, senior defence officer at the time, Angus Houston, who um, uh, publicly said that he'd given certain advice to Peter Reith, uh, went on to become chief of the defence force and somebody who was uh, greatly regarded by my government and by subsequent governments. So I, I don't feel any um, embarrassment in relation to that. The national disability, the concept of a national disability scheme I, I support, should we have done it? Well, I suppose um, uh, you might argue that I was not as uh, persuaded uh, that other methods couldn't work as well. I was particularly attracted to uh, a voucher system that uh, Mal Brough, who was the final person to occupy that portfolio in my government devised. I think my answer on that is that, sure, the National Disability Scheme, provided it is properly funded and property, properly trialled, uh, will be beneficial, but it does have to be paid for. And uh, I, I do hope that it doesn't involve too many examples of one size fitting all. Um, uh, and that's why I was particularly attracted to the voucher system that Ruff was developing. Thank you. This question down. Thank you. All the Australian way of government have become progressively more open the role of senior public servants has become more challenging. What advice can you offer for younger leaders of the public service? Well, I think what you can offer, one, one two pieces of advice. The first advice is don't believe, despite everything I've said about Roland Wilson, I meant it, and others such as Fred Wheeler, who was really the one, quote, mandarin of the old order uh, that I had uh, contact with. Don't believe the idea that um, uh, there are no longer any frank and fearless public servants who say what they think. I mean, my experience was that there were plenty of public servants who said exactly what they thought and said it very directly and said it to uh, 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 political figures of both sides of politics. I think we have become um, more open in exchanges uh, of opinions between the public service uh, and the rest of the community. Uh, it, it was the case in the Menzies period, a period for which I have great admiration I've written about, it was the case that um, the public service, uh, many of them resent uh, advice coming from other sources. There was a wonderful quote that I have in my book about, uh, from John Bunting, in which he, he talks about how Tremendously important, the, the role of what was the equivalent of a chief of staff could be, you know, making sure uh, that appointments are kept and that the minister's appearance is up to date and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but of course, always at a remove from policy, the IDV. Now, the truth is that uh, we live in a world now where advice in every field is contestable. And uh, the intelligent public servants and there are so many of them that I dealt with, uh, didn't really resent um, other advice. They did resent, legitimately, um, their advice not being considered. I mean, one of the standing requirements I had in my own office was that uh, if the advice of the department was not to be taken, 
there had to be proper explanation given as to why it was not to be taken and that the interaction between the department and the office had to be one of respect and professional engagement. And uh, I can again uh, mention my own experience with Arthur Sinodinus and Tony Nutt, who is my principal private secretary. Uh, it, it helped enormously. My own experience was very positive in relation to the public service. And uh, uh, I think the most important thing is to disabuse younger public servants of the idea that they're no longer listened to and they're uh, no longer mattered, that it's all. I, 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 that was not my experience, and uh, I'd be, there may have been some ups and downs since, and I mean, I've been out of it for seven years, so I shouldn't pretend that things have remained the same, they certainly haven't. But uh, uh, I think uh, the idea that the golden, there was a golden age and that's gone and it's never coming back. It's, that age is not coming back, but uh, a different, more contemporary, contestable age is with us. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for your speech. Uh, you talked about the, your comments about the 40 40 20 uh, vote split, the, yeah. the uh, tribalization of the electorate. Do you think this trend will continue? And if so, do you think that we'll see a recurrence of minority governments? Of minority governments? And well, I think. I think um, uh, the fragmentation, um, a certain amount of fragmentation is with us because we are just no longer as ideological uh, as we were. And, and in a sense, this is a product of the fall of the Berlin Wall. I know that's uh, perhaps stretching things a bit, but we did, I mean, I grew up, I mean, I'm a bit older than you are, and, uh, 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 and I'm a lot of people in this audience, but we did, we did grow up in an era where, where it seemed as though not only was the world divided, uh, uh, geostrategically but was also divided economically between the more or less capitalist world led by the United States and the command economy model and 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 there are a lot of people even as late as the middle 1980s who was um, have seriously uh, argued the moral equivalence between the West and the Soviet Union and and uh, uh, people still believe that uh, uh, maybe the uh, uh, command economy model would would triumph now when it all ended uh, to oversimplify it, I think the world moved a bit to the right, if I can use that expression, when it came to economics. I mean, I can remember <laughs> in the first budget I heard introduced by Frank Freen in 1974, he actually had a paragraph in the budget in which he said that the um, relatively subdued conditions in the private sector make it possible to transfer more resources to the public sector. In other words, it was an objective of budget policy to shift resources into the public sector. I, don't, I never heard Wayne Swan say that in, at the height of the, uh, of, the, of the Rudd and Gillard, or particularly the Rudd government's response to the global financial downturn. So I think um, a, lot of, a certain amount of the ideology is gone. And when that happens, you do get a fragmentation. I, mean, I run into fewer people who now say to me, my father would spit in his grave if I knew, if he knew I was voting Liberal or knew I was voting Labor. But you used to hear that very commonly in the 1950s and 60s. So I think it's, I don't think we're going to go back. I think um, fragmentation is going to, and of course, it, it, it's having an impact on both parties. I think it's probably having a little more impact on the Labor Party. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think some of the reaction of the Labor Party to the success of the Greens in those two inner city state seats in Newtown and Balmain uh, uh, is interesting and uh, it's obviously having quite an impact. And of course, you're seeing it being played out in a different way, but the same forces are at work in, in the United Kingdom. I wonder, just on that, Mr Howard, whether you, whether you think that this breakdown in tribalism that we're observing has anything at all to do with the changing nature of the media, and in particular social media? I think, Kenneth, it predated uh, the social media. The so social media is probably fueling it, but it, it predated it. I mean, Pauline Hanson was um, 1997, 1998, <coughs> and that was, uh, there was no Twitter and Facebook when I was Prime Minister, I mean, not that I, there's any connection between the two. <laughs> but, uh, and, you know, I think, thank heavens, I, <laughs> Trouble. <laughs> yeah, maybe it has made life more difficult. <laughs> yeah, we have a question. 
Um, Menzies' early years as Prime Minister made good use of international experience of many Syria, uh, senior public Sorry, servants. You study, you know, Sorry. Um, Menzies' early years as Prime Minister made good use of international experience of many senior public servants. In what ways should Prime Ministers invest in international experience of their public servants? In what, uh, <coughs> to what extent should Prime Ministers have international experience? Uh, now, public, senior public servants with international. Oh, oh right. I'm sorry. I'm <coughs> forgive me. Yes. Um, <coughs> um, a, a great deal. Um, I mean, I, I don't. Although I, I had a, uh, a long-standing interest in foreign policy and defence, and uh, something of an instinctive sympathy for uh, our defence forces from the from the very beginning. I don't pretend in my pre-prime ministerial years to have had um, uh, a sophisticated involvement with international affairs, and I relied very heavily on public servants and a range of them, many of the number of them are here tonight, <coughs> uh, who uh, advised me very closely, uh, and uh, I found uh, their advice uh, extremely valuable. Um, I think. It's very important in the crucial public policy areas to have as much stability as possible. Uh, I always remark that one of the reasons why some people are kind enough to regard my government as having been stable and perhaps uh, modestly successful was that we had the same people occupying the Prime Ministership, the Treasury portfolio and the Foreign Affairs portfolio for the entire period. We were in government. Now, not everybody within the party was necessarily happy with that arrangement. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I always acknowledge that. Uh, but uh, uh, the point I make is that um, you you do need that. And I, but I found the advice, obviously, of, of people such as uh, Philip Flood and Ashton Calvert and and uh, and. Uh, and Peter Barghese here tonight, and Michael Thornton, the list could go on, and Dennis Richards, and all of whom had a tremendous background um, in foreign affairs, uh, extremely valuable, Rick Smith, and so on. And I didn't always take their advice, um, but you don't. I mean, the important, the, the way it should work is you listen to the advice, and if you don't take it, you should indicate why, but in the end, if, if you follow that process, um, uh, then the system works. I think in the area of international affairs and defence, the, the best thing my government did institutionally was to uh, establish the National Security Committee, which involved not only the senior ministers, but also involved at the same time as part of the body, the, the senior public service advisors, I found those gatherings where you could talk about national security issues with the head of foreign affairs and defence and the CDF and, and ONA and, and uh, ASIA. I, I found those meetings absolutely invaluable and that forum brought forth a, an understanding and an exchange of ideas that was certainly to me and I think to my other colleagues invaluable. We have time for one more question. Uh, Thank you for your talk. My question relates to a comment you made in your presentation about the politician having the apprenticeship, you know, the union movement. If you're a Conservative, you jump straight to a staffer in the Minister's office. The question relates to the policy advice of the policy advisors to Ministers and whether you see that um, as a problem and interfering with the work of the public service or do you see it as another source of advice noting that some of the advisers may not have a lot of world experience? Well it, it will vary according to people. Um, in an ideal world uh, you will have non-public service policy advisers who are savvy in the policy area, uh, respectful and professional in their dealings with the public service but you'll also have a minister or a prime minister who has a capacity to um, uh, sift information and make the right decisions. I think 
of the pieces of paper that came across my desk as Prime Minister deserved immediate endorsement because they were self-evident and common sense pieces of advice. It was the 10% that you, you had to deliberate on and that involved working out what was the 10% because the 90% don't have flags at the top <laughs> saying, you know, this should be automatically endorsed, even that, that might be the wish of the author of the advice. Um, uh, you, and having that capacity to prioritise, uh, that's where I think uh, extremely astute, good quality private office staff are very important. Uh, but it, it'll just vary enormously. I mean, if you get somebody who's on, on a minister's staff who's essentially been just a political apparatchik and has no policy field at all, and that person has enormous influence, that can be quite bad. Uh, but on the other hand, if you get somebody who's, who's got good policy instincts but just is at or removed from uh, the public service stream of advice and brings another perspective, an outside economic perspective. Uh, and uh, I mean, I'll embarrass him by saying that when I first became treasurer, John Hewson was on my staff and, and uh, uh, he was extremely valuable to me because he was a very skillful economist. He brought a different perspective uh, and uh, but he interacted well with the public service. So I think it um, depends entirely upon uh, the circumstances and the individual and particularly the, uh, the frame of mind and attitude of the minister. If, if he is just involved in a purely political exercise all the time, um, then that's bad. Equally, if he is completely a policy captive of his or her department, that's bad as well. Okay. Uh, Mr Howard, I, I want to thank you very much on behalf of the Sir Roland Wilson Foundation uh, which uh, I'm honoured to be chair. Uh, you've, you've given us a lot of food for thought. You took us back to 1951 and you covered a lot of ground uh, in your address. You reminded us that whilst uh, that period from 1951 to 1966 is usually seen as a period of great stability, and that is largely true, it was nevertheless not a period without its own particular challenges, and in particular the the um, uh, wool price spike um, associated with the Korean War, which turned out to be a relatively short shock, if a big one, um, and, and a shock that turns out to have been very well handled, although, of course, at the time it was incredibly unpopular. Um, and uh, I, I know I've had occasion to look at a, an editorial written uh, in the Sydney Morning Herald at the time that basically said both the government and its advisers have lost sense. Um, it, it was much more colourfully written than that, actually. <laughs> um, uh, so this was not a period without its challenges, but then, of course, when the oil price shocks of the 1970s hit, we found that we had bigger challenges to deal with, and as you said, the policy apparatus found itself not at all up to the task, and so the case for economic reform became increasingly obvious. Um, and by the 1980s, uh, there was uh, a bipartisanship uh, that had developed around the case for quite wide-ranging economic reforms. You then uh, addressed the question why it is that reform seems to have stalled, appears to have stalled, and you took us through several reasons that might explain some of what appears to be stagnation in economic reform but you gave us reason for hope. And in particular, you, you uh, said to us that um, reformers have to have a proper appreciation of the appropriate balance or getting the appropriate balance or interplay between policy and politics. And in particular, you left us with the important message that Australians will listen to good argument that's in the national interest, uh, provided the outcomes are seen as being fair. And uh, I think I would have to agree with that. Um, I want to uh, thank you on behalf of everybody who is here to thank you for having been so generous with your time to have come down to this place that, is, as you knew before you got here, can be cold. <laughs> uh, 
And, uh, and uh, I want to thank you also for being so open in your responses to, to questions. Uh, we have a little memento here for you, a little, a little gift from this Roland Wilson Foundation. Thank you. Thank you.